hybrid stat central seminar in a long time. Oh, the first ever hybrid stat central seminar, I should say. And uh, thank you for everyone who's come along um, online and in person. Uh, today, uh, Mark is going to be talking about uh, multivariable uh, modeling. So um, a few do's and don'ts, which I'm very interested to hear. Uh, and yeah, I guess I should do the usual um, intro to Stat Central because um, some people might be um, just uh, getting introduced to us. Uh, we're a centralized stats consulting unit for researchers at UNSW. So if you're a HDR student, uh, you can um, book in for a consultation for us and we can provide you with statistical support throughout your PhD uh, program. And we encourage you to come to see us uh, whenever you need, but in particular, um, don't be shy and, and wait. Um, it's always better to come and see us early and, um, and get advice um, at the design stage of your PhD as well as um, throughout. Um, we also run courses, which have been flicking up on the screen and these are coming up. Uh, next week, we're running an intro to our course uh, we have in, uh, and an intermediate R course. Uh, so it, it's not too late to enroll in, in those courses. And a couple of weeks after that, we've got our intro to stats course and regression modeling courses in May. So uh, definitely check them out. Uh, other than that, over to Mark. <laughs> Thanks, Eve. Um, just bear with me while I get my presentation up. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that and can hear me pretty well now. Um, so yeah, as Eve said, I'm going to be talking about a few do's and don'ts of multivariable regression modeling. Uh, and I don't want to make it uh, feel like this. Um, I know a lot of stats advice can sometimes feel like it's 10 do's and 500 don'ts, but I, I've tried to make it equal. I got the same number of do's and, and don'ts. Can I get this thing off my screen? Oh, okay, if I don't touch it. Yeah. That's a lot. Seeing the, all, right. <laughs> all right, so the, the first uh, don't is a, is a simple one. Um, it's not super important, but um, we like to be precise in stats. So uh, don't confuse multivariable with multivariate. So they sound very similar. One's got an extra syllable, but um, multivariable is referring basically to the X variables, your predictors, your covariates, the explanatory variables. Um, so when it's multivariable, you've got more than one explanatory variable. Uh, and multivariate is referring to your Y variable, your outcome variable, um, the thing that you're trying to predict. Uh, and so a multivariate model is one where you've got multiple outcome variables. And that's, um, that's kind of rare, um, but it can happen in situations where you've measured lots of things that are you know correlated with one another, like species counts, if you're doing a ecology study and you've counted the number of different uh, species in an area, for example, and you want to take into account the correlation in that outcome variable. Uh, so it is possible to have a multivariate, multivariable regression model if you've got multiple X variables and multiple Y variables. So we've got to do now. So do clearly decide on your research question and choose your approach accordingly. This is probably the most important one here. Um, the number of times someone comes to you and says, I want to fit a multivariable model, and you say why, and they're not really sure. Uh, it happens quite a lot. Uh, so there are there are lots of reasons why you might want to fit a multivariable regression model. So you, you might want to be do, to do a descriptive analysis, so describing the relationship between your covariates and an outcome. Um, so that might be if you're trying to estimate the effect of a covariate of interest and adjust for other covariates. 
Uh, and that's a common way of estimating causal effects. Um, so in that situation, you want to have a good idea of what you think the causal structure is, how the covariates relate to one another and the outcome. Um, and interpretability is often an important concern there. So uh, again, you want to interpret something as being causal maybe, and uh, you want to use maybe a simpler method that allows you to estimate parameters that have a clear interpretation. Uh, another reason you might do a multivariable model is to predict outcomes for a new subject. Um, so you've got some data and you want to predict um, the outcome using that data. Um, uh, one reason you might do that is to compute propensity scores for use in you know, further analysis. Um, and in this situation, the interpretability is maybe not as important. You don't really care how it gets to the answer, just that the answer is that the prediction is close to the true value. Uh, and that kind of opens your world up to more complex um, machine learning methods, if, if you can consider them um, regression. Um, another reason you might want to do a multivariable model is to select a subset of covariates that are associated with the outcome. Here, there's a massive range of approaches. Some of them are better than others. Um, and I'm going to do this quite a lot of times during the seminar because I don't have time to go, <laughs> go through every point in detail. But you can go to our website. We've got an archive of all of the seminars that we've done over the years. Uh, and if you look back to August 2020, there's slides and video from a great seminar about selecting uh, variable selection in a multivariable regression model uh, and a few do's and don't, don'ts for that. Um, and another thing you might want to do is rank the importance of a list of covariates and say, you know, this is the most important thing for predicting the outcome. Uh, and the answer to that question depends on how you define importance. And again, <laughs> go back to October 2020 and you'll find uh, some more information about doing that. So uh, back to a don't, I'm gonna go do, don't, do, don't. Uh, don't commit the table two fallacy. So can anyone uh, spot the problem with this table? Hopefully you can kind of read it. If anyone online wants to unmute yourselves, I hopefully can hear you. No one? It's including a, um, a, the hypnotics only, which is unrelated to the other. It's, All right. No, no one's brave enough to have a guess, Eve. Oh, that's a good guess. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Multiple comparisons as in uh, we've presented, I don't know even how many, probably 40, 40 odd 95% confidence intervals. So the probability that uh, any one of them doesn't include the true value is probably going to be quite high. Um, that's not what I was looking for. I was looking for... Uh, the table two fallacy. <laughs> so this is actually called table two. So it's called the table two fallacy because table one in a paper is usually like, or in a clinical paper is, is usually like describing the population, like de demographics. Uh, and then what people often do in table two is to fit a multivariable regression model and chuck all of the regression es parameter estimates and their confidence intervals into a table, maybe put some p-values on there. Um, and call that table two. And the reason why this is called a fallacy uh, is basically that there's this implicit suggestion that the adjusted estimates can be interpreted in the same way, right? You, you don't think I need to interpret this hazard ratio differently from that hazard ratio because they're in the same table, they're in the same format. Um, and the problem with this is that, so if the model's correct, um, they might actually represent different types of causal effects. So one of them might be a direct causal effect and one of them might be a total causal effect. Um, and the second problem, which is probably more important, is that if there are unmeasured confounders of your secondary effects, 
So if we're assuming there's a primary thing that we're trying to estimate and we're just adjusting for other things, um, even if that adjustment is fine, if there are unmeasured confounders of the adjustment variables, the secondary coefficients can't be interpreted as causal effects at all. Uh, and they might also just be subject to collider bias. So even if you've est estimated your primary um, relationship perfectly well by adjusting for all your confounders, um, the estimates of the secondary um, coefficients don't have a causal interpretation and they might also be biased uh, unless your model is perfectly correct. Uh, and this gets complicated even further if you've got effect heterogeneity, which means that the effect uh, of the variable depends on other coefficients, um, other covariates. Uh, and you can read more about this in these two papers. So the original paper, which came up with the term um, table two fallacy is that first one. And then the second one kind of gives a thorough example of a real life um, situation where how it can happen. So do, uh, do make sure your sample size is adequate. Uh, this is a very difficult question to answer. Uh, there are some rules of thumb around. Um, one that I see quite a lot is that you need to have at least 10 times as many observations as the number of predictors that you have. But this is not one size fits all. This is not like any regression model you ever want to do needs this many observations. Um, I, I tried to find where that rule of thumb originally came from, and I couldn't. The paper that, well, the book that a lot of people cite when they mention this rule actually talks about how in the majority of cases you need 15 observations or 20 observations per variable and 10 observations per variable worked all right in a certain situation. So it's not one size fits all. It depends on the goal of your analysis, the signal to noise ratio and the relationships between the covariates. So in a, in a really tightly controlled experiment, you can have uh, a very good signal to noise ratio and you can have kind of orthogonal covariates and you can actually get quite good uh, estimation accuracy with a small sample size um, but in a you know in a, in a different situation with you know low signal to noise ratios you might need a lot more than 10 observations per predictor uh, and just a thing to note is that you should actually consider not the sample size but what what some people call the limiting sample size or the effective sample size. Um, and the idea of that is that's, um, this is the value that's actually related to the accuracy of your estimation or the power of your, um, uh, your hypothesis tests. Um, so in it, when you've got a binary outcome, the limiting sample size is actually this, the size of the smaller outcome group. So if you've got a sample size of 5,000, but only 10 of them had events, your limiting sample size, it's like having a sample size of 10, basically. Uh, and in a time to event outcome, um, the limiting sample size is the number of events, a uh, similar idea. Hi, just go to a don't, so don't yeah. use bivariate relationships to choose candidate variables. Uh, this is a pretty common approach. Um, what you could do, sounds kind of sensible. So you got a large list of covariates. For each of them, you can fit a single model, um, a univariable model, so just one predictor and one outcome. Uh, and if your p-value is small enough, you then include that variable in your multivariable model. Uh, and there's a question there about how to set that cutoff value, alpha. Um, you could use 0.05, but then people say, oh, you might miss a few things that are important. Let's put it at 0.1, why not 0.2? Um, there's no really good, <laughs> good choice there. Uh, this is sometimes called bivariable screening or univariables, uh, bivariable selection or univariable screening. Um, but basically this is a bad idea. Um, and the reason is that covariates that are only important after adjusting for another one will just be mixed, missed altogether. So even uh, if you've heard of forward selection where you're adding things into the model one at a time, uh, this is like doing forward selection, except anything that doesn't make it in at the first step just gets completely forgotten about. So it can't even get in, even if it's found to be important after you adjust for some other variables. Um, 
So this can happen when you've got basically uncontrolled confounding uh, and there's a good paper you can look up for examples of, of why that's a bad idea. Uh, okay, do consider uncertainty. Um, so this is general stats advice, <laughs> do consider uncertainty, but uh, in the context of regression modeling, you should consider the uncertainty that comes throughout your entire modeling process. Um, so if you performed variable selection, you wouldn't necessarily get the same variables every time. And I don't mean that in the sense that there's something random going on in your computer program. I mean, if uh, you did an experiment and did variable selection, and then I did one and did variable selection, we might not end up with the same set of variables. Um, and so that's some uncertainty there. It's not like if, you, if you're doing variable selection, the set of variables you end up at the end is not the truth, there's some uncertainty there, right? Um, so one thing uh, that is a good idea is, is to think of how the results would change if the data changed. Uh, this is difficult to do if the process has manual intervention. So if you're making um, kind of particular choices throughout the process, yes? But um, uh, if, the manual intervention is guided by um, substantive knowledge. Um, isn't that a better thing rather than just relying on whatever the data is doing? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. The question for if the people online didn't hear, uh, the question was, uh, isn't it better to use manual intervention if that's including some kind of substantive subject knowledge uh, instead of just letting the your automated program do the work. Uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that is true, but uh, I still think it's important to consider the uncertainty that happens before you get to that point, let's say, and that's difficult to do <laughs> uh, because, because one idea to, uh, to consider the uncertainty is bootstrapping, which is basically where you resample your data sets. So you pretend you've got new data sets uh, and you repeat the whole modeling process and kind of see what happens, see how many times you get um, the same variables or different sets of variables. Okay, online question. Um, uh, I'm going to ask Lisa's question and then at a perfect time, I'll go back to ask one about a table two. Mm -hmm. um, can you confirm that you are stating not to use forward selection? Can we assume that using, for example, the step function and AIC, DIC, which effectively does backward selection and a criterion based evaluation with the most parsimony small? Can I confirm that I'm saying not to do it? Uh, no, I'm not going to say never to do it. Um, I I used to kind of think never do it. Um, and I, then I said on Twitter, how can I convince people not to do this? And I got a whole heap of very smart statisticians saying, actually, it can be pretty good in some situations. Um, so it depends on the situation. I'm saying don't do the bivariable screening thing. That's a bad idea. Board selection is not a great idea but it can actually get you decent results sometimes. And again, going back to my first do, it depends what the goal of your analysis is. Um, so think about that before you do it. Um, was there another question? Uh, yeah, this is a, about the table two um, slide. Uh, uh, yeah. Michael wants to know, um, so if that's the fallacy, um, how are we to report variates other than as they do in table two? Or oh, yeah. is it or is it simply a when you're reporting this, you need to know exactly what you're actually saying? Yeah, sorry, yeah, I forgot to mm -hmm. I got to say that. <laughs> yeah, uh, this the original paper's got some recommendations for what to do instead. Um, basically, uh, what they suggest is present the your primary estimate. So in this case, that's the first row. It's usually going to be the first one. Present that as it is, because that is a, you know, direct causal effect or whatever it is you're estimating. Uh, and put the other ones in a separate table where you explain what they are and how they're different. Like you say, you know, this one is a um, confounder effect or whatever it is, depending on how you've set up your causal model. Um, I think they also suggest maybe they can just go in the footnotes because those estimates aren't kind of important anyway. 
um, because they have that kind of potential non-causal meaning and also bias. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Oh, yeah. So where were we at? Oh yeah, so, so the idea of uh, bootstrapping is to uh, resample your data set, repeat the modeling process, and see how often you get the same variables. So you can do this like a thousand times and you can see maybe the same variable shows up 999 times. That gives you pretty good confidence that it's an important one. Um, maybe a variable only shows up once, which kind of suggests that it's not important, but hey, what if that showed up in your original data set? If you didn't consider the uncertainty, you wouldn't realize that it might just be a fluke that it showed up that time. Um, so this, the paper reference there is kind of the original paper about bootstrapping for model uncertainty. Um, this R package called mplot has some kind of useful inbuilt functions for doing it automatically for certain types of models. Um, so I'll just show you this example here. This, what this is, is they call it a model stability plot. Um, and what it does is they, they resample their data a thousand times and they, for each uh, model size, which is on the x-axis, um, they find the best model on each data set. Uh, and the size of this, so each circle is a different set of covariates that were selected. Uh, and the size of the circle is how often they were selected. So uh, in, the real, in the real package, you can kind of mouse over these and it shows you more information like that. Um, but you can see that uh, the if we look at the, best model with two parameters in it, 76% of the time uh, it was BMI was the best predictor of uh, diabetes progression, which I forgot to mention. <laughs> uh, so this is a, pre yeah, a predictive model of diabetes progression and there's a bunch of um, uh, biomarkers kind of entered in there. And so, yeah, 76% of the time BMI was uh, the most important single predictor. Um, but what's kind of interesting is, uh, so these are colored by depending on whether the model includes HDL or not. Uh, and you can kind of see the HDL is not included most of the time it starts. There's a red circle just there when you get four predictors. When you got five predictors, um, it's in the most common model, but it's also uh, just misses out in the second most common model. And then when you move up to six predictors, uh, it's kind of definitely in there. Uh, and the thing that it was competing with total cholesterol uh, doesn't appear at all. So these are, these are the complicated things you need to think about, um, but you can only really get a handle on if you think about the uncertainty that comes with your, your results. If you just, again, if you just fit the model on your original data set, you'll just get one of these dots here and you don't know how it fits into the overall picture. Uh, so don't uh, use the usual p-values or confidence intervals after variable selection. Uh, so we're saying variable selection is fine to do, um, but p-values and confidence intervals uh, should be, or they are based on the sampling distribution of the coefficient estimates. And the sampling distribution is uh, the distribution of estimates that you would get if you repeated your experiment over and over again. So, you know, if you repeat your experiment, you'll get a different estimate of whatever parameter is parameter it is that you're interested in. The sampling distribution is kind of the distribution of all of those estimates um, in the long run. Um, and that's how you calculate p-values and confidence intervals. Uh, when your model is pre-specified, so you say, I'm going to fit a model with these variables in it, um, those sampling distributions kind of have a nice form. They're, asymptotically normal. So there are these kind of simple-ish standard formulas that are implemented in all stats packages. So once you fit your model, it'll spit out the confidence intervals and p-values. Um, but after you implement a variable selection procedure, these formulas do not apply. Uh, so this is what's called post-selection inference. Um, so the sampling distribution is a mix of zeros and biased non-zeros. Uh, it's not a nice kind of normal distribution anymore. Um, so you can't do model selection and then fit that model 
and use the confidence intervals and p-values because they're reflecting a different sampling distribution to the truth. Um, and this paper has actually shown that it's uh, impossible to consistently estimate this distribution, uh, which doesn't sound great. Um, but there are things you can do for post-selection inference if that's the goal of your analysis. Uh, and again, if you go back to February 2021, uh, we have a talk about that as well. Uh, so, so far we've had a, the equal number of do's and don'ts, right? And now I want to do a bunch more do's just to give a positive feeling before we go. Uh, so do visualize your data. This is um, this is general stats advice as well. <laughs> um, so this is uh, an example of uh, 12 data sets that all have the same uh, summary statistics. So the mean of both variables and the correlation is the same in all 12 of these examples, but they tell you a completely different story. So, and you wouldn't have any idea of that unless you visualize it. Uh, and actually there's a 13th uh, data set which has the same summary statistics. Um, and that would be pretty cool if you plotted your data and it looked like that. Um, that doesn't happen very often, unfortunately. Um, that's pretty easy in two dimensions. It's a lot harder when you've got, you know, big data sets to visualize your data. Um, again, we've got you covered. Go back to September 2020, and uh, we have a talk about an R package that helps with visualizing data in, in high dimensions. Uh, do allow for flexibility if you can afford it. Um, so linearity is usually just a simplifying assumption. Like we usually don't expect effects in real life to be linear, you know, a risk of disease doesn't go up the same amount with every year of age, um, for example, um, but maybe it's all right to approximate that relationship with a straight line. Um, but if you've got enough data um, and you can afford to do it, um, allow for non-linearities. This is some examples of non-linearities from um, a package in R that's very good at uh, handling them. You can do kind of two-dimensional non-linearities, three-dimensional ones. You can do things with spatial correlations and all that kind of fancy stuff. So that's what's called a generalized additive model, uh, which allows a lot of flexibility. The additive obviously replacing the, the normal linear there. Uh, do consider the distribution of your outcome variable because this is often going to determine the, the type of model that you're going to fit. Um, it's kind of the most important uh, thing. But I have included I've included a few suggestions here. So if you've got continuous unbounded data, then linear regression might make sense. If it's bounded, uh, you might look at beta regression, binary data, you know, logistic regression, count data, plus on maybe. Uh, proportional hazard models are good for time to event data, um, but I've included question marks there because uh, this shouldn't be like a cookbook, like a recipe, right? This shouldn't be like, I've got uh, count data, therefore, plus on. You need to really think about how that data was generated um, and think about the assumptions of the model and how they line up with the data. You might have, you know, um, changing variance with linear regression or you might have, you know, zero inflation with count data, things, things like that, um, that you need to take into consideration. Uh, and this is one way that you can do it by looking at the residuals. So do check your assumptions. Um, residuals can be used as a diagnostic tool for uh, the kind of main assumptions of regression models. So your linearity assumptions uh, and your distributional assumptions. Uh, this gets more complicated um, if you've got random effects in your model or discrete outcomes. Um, but once again, if you go back into the SAT Central archives, you can find a talk in July 2020 about um, residuals. Do you think about how to handle missing data? Uh, the default approach in statistical approaches, that I think that's supposed to say packages, uh, is row-wise or case-wise deletion. So that's where if uh, a row is missing any of its values, you throw it away. Um, 
sometimes called complete case analysis because you're only keeping the observations that have all of their data. This is usually a bad idea. Um, the appropriate approach depends on the missingness mechanism. So that's again, something to think about. If your data is missing completely at random, that's MCAR, um, complete case analysis is all right. So that's if your data is just, there's no way to predict what data is missing basically. Um, missing at random is the situation where uh, there are some variables that predict missingness, but you have those variables. Um, and in those cases, there's some, there's a few different uh, ways you can go about it. Uh, and missing not at random is the trickiest situation, which is where uh, the missingness is related to the variable that you don't have. Uh -huh. So obviously example is like, you know, if you're asking people about their health, but the people who are sicker are not coming in to answer your questions. So the fact that it's missing tells you something about the value that you don't have. Uh, and that's the trickiest situation. Um, it's usually, uh, you're usually then having to deal with untestable assumptions, which makes things even trickier. Um, but again, we have actually got two seminars that you can check out uh, about handling missing data. Uh, do worry about overfitting. This kind of sounds like a don't, but I've made it a do. <laughs> uh, so usually models are fit by maximizing some performance measure with respect to the data that you feed into it. Um, so when you apply that model to a separate data set, because you've maximized it in relation to the data that you've got, when you apply it to a separate data set, it's almost never going to fit as well as it did when you maximized to that data set. So I say almost because you could get lucky, but uh, it's pretty much never going to happen. Um, so you can't really get a uh, model fit statistic and say that this is how well my model is going to fit to any other data set, because it's almost always going to fit worse than that to an external data set. Um, so how do you estimate how well your model is going to fit to an external data set? Um, one idea is a, to a data split. So that's where you take uh, some percentage of your data, you use that to fit your model, and then you check how well it fits on the separate set of data that's been kept completely out of the fitting process. Um, some people don't like that because it's kind of like, it's not wasting data, but you're not using as much data as you can to inform the model in the first place. Um, so there are ideas like cross-validation, which is where you, you uh, in turn, you take out parts of the data, you do the training and test split, and then you do it with a different training and test split set. Uh, and you repeat that process and you combine the results in the end. Um, there's also optimism adjustment, which is basically the idea of trying to get an idea of um, the amount of overfitting, like how much optimism do you have in your internal model fit if you were trying to use that to estimate your external model fit. Um, and there are some methods that you can use to reduce overfitting. Uh, they usually, I think a catch-all term is like regularization. Um, penalization is maybe a subset of that, I guess. Um, so you might have heard of lasso, bridge regression, elastic net, regression splines. Um, and one, one tricky thing there is to choose like the penalty parameter um, and an approach that you can use to do that is, is to use cross-validation. And the final do is to do yourself a favor. Uh, just remember that regression modeling is hard. Uh, it is not easy and it's it's not really something, uh, as you might have guessed, I can't really cover the whole topic in a half hour talk. Um, and this is just a, a quote from a paper by like a bunch of really smart statisticians who said there's, there's not yet enough evidence on which to base recommendations for the selection of variables and functional forms in multivariable analysis. So if you're saying I want to select variables, these guys are saying, oh, I, I can't recommend how to do that. <laughs> uh, that's an idea of how tricky it is. Uh, read a good textbook. This isn't the only one, obviously, but this is kind of one of the more famous ones, Frank Harrell's Regression Modeling Strategies. Um, it's available on ebook on the, through the UNSW library. Uh, and speak 
to a statistician. Um, it's that central, we exist. Um, we can help you, hopefully. Uh, and we've also got an upcoming short course um, all about regression modeling uh, next month. So thank you for your attention and coming along. Happy to take questions. I have an online question yep. um, back about the uh, dealing with the missing data. Um, um, so how about assigning missing data to a variable category and fitting the variable as a categorical variable? Oh, yeah. What's that called? Uh, that's got a name like missing indicator method or something like that, I think. Um, I think that's been shown not to be a great idea. Um, I'm not 100% across it, I'm afraid, but um, the thing to Google is, yeah, missing, missing ind indicator method. Missing indicator method, yeah. Um, I think it might, might, maybe it's all right in some situations, maybe it's not in others. Um, and again, classic statistician answer, it depends on your missingness mechanism. Um, if, if all of those observations are missing for a specific reason, then maybe it's all right to kind of model that reason in your data set. But if it, they're not all missing for the same reason, then treating that as the same observation is maybe not a great idea um, compared to something like multiple imputation, which accounts for the fact that you've got uncertainty about what that value is. Anything else yeah. online? Nothing here. What? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. All right. Well, thanks a lot, everyone. Um, thanks for coming.